welcome to RPV City Talk. RPV City Talk is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes to inform the community on recent city matters. RPV City Talk is a weekly show that features the RPV Mayor, City Council, or City Employees. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Brown Swanson and welcome to RPV City Talk. It's always great to be in the council chambers with our great mayor of RPV, Mayor Ken Dida. We are back again for our monthly update. How are you? I'm doing quite well in spite of the heat. Yes, you look amazing. You're all over the place and uh, we appreciate all you're doing for the community always. So we always like to take a look at sort of council action in the last month through September. You guys are busy, um, but just to bring our community up to speed, we always want to talk public safety first. Your top priority is always public safety. How are we doing on that front? How's crime and all of that? Going? We're doing quite well. Even before all the ALPRs were installed, uh, we had three uh, contacts and arrests. Uh, so that's working. Uh, I believe almost all of them are installed by now. There is a second phase of installing a video cameras along Western Avenue on a lot of the intersections where it would be cost prohibitive to put ALPRs. They're not quite as instantaneous, but they're tied directly to the sheriff, so they do provide uh, extra coverage. And with that, I hope the uh, community of people who intend to come to our city for nefarious purposes will learn that we are protected they are going to be caught, and they will know that our site is hardened, and they're going to have to go someplace else. When you say ALPR, for our viewers watching that may not watch council meetings or know that term, that's the automatic license plate reader cameras that we now have, there were, I think, 41 of them being installed peninsula-wide just to track cars that are coming in, um, reading the license plates, and that will help law enforcement as a tool to yes. know who's coming in and who's going out. Yes, the, the ALPRs, they look only at license plates and the system is set up so that the, the license plate is scanned and there's a database of license plates and potential license plates that could be a problem. And that shows up almost in, in, in just seconds. And everybody knows, which gives the Sheriff's Department the opportunity to cordon off the area and capture the people who are violating it. And the one thing that I do want to say is that this has been a great thing because we've covered the perimeter of the peninsula. Now, although PV Estates is not part of our regional sheriff's department, they have joined us and it's a four city wide uh, effort. The perimeter of the cities, of all the cities on the peninsula is covered and that's a great thing. Right, and of course the city needed, the council decided to do this as multiple steps the way you're increasing resources to stay on top of crime to continue to keep rpv to be one of the safest communities really in the state but you know what one burglary feels like too much right so you've got to be on it yes it does we've had a spike here a little more than a year ago uh, that really got everybody's attention uh, it's come down uh, and that's a good thing. I think once uh, people understand that we got ALPRs, they're not going to take the risk. Um, and so it should come down even further. Uh, people are beginning to understand the problem that uh, exists now that didn't in 1973. I was going to say that. I mean, you were a city founder on the first council, and you know better than ever. I mean, it's just life isn't what it was. I no. mean, you just have to have your guard up. The, the population of the area has increased, although our city is fortunate. It didn't increase only by a thousand people, by the way, since uh, 1973. So we've met one of our goals there, but that has increased. The social media has increased and the uh, community of thieves and, and ne'er-do-wells use that to their advantage. Now we have lots we're going to talk about on the show. We're going to take a quick break and come right back with some more questions with Mayor Dida, so stay tuned for that. Recently, there has been an increase of burglaries in our community. The Sheriff's Department and the Police Department are working hard to combat the problem and they would like you to get involved. If you see something, say something. If you see something out of the ordinary in your neighborhood, take pictures and call the police. Be on the lookout for unidentified vehicles or persons in your neighborhood and write down license plate numbers and vehicle descriptions so you can give accurate information to law enforcement. Get to know your neighbors and form a neighborhood watch. 
Let neighbors know when you're out of town so they can watch over your house. Remember to lock your doors even when you're home. Secure gates and backyard access at all times. Keep valuables out of sight and arm your home with an alarm. Never let strangers inside of your home. Request identification from people who claim they need to work on your house or say they're from the utilities company. If you see something, say something. Let's prevent crime together. For more information on crime prevention, go to the website, lamita.lasd.org. Welcome back to RPV City Talk. I'm here with Mayor Dida, and we are talking about public safety. Um, you gave us an update on the, how we're doing on the crime front, and now about emergency preparedness. September is National Preparedness Month, and um, you know, here in our community, we have all kinds of organizations like CERT trying to train everyone to be ready, be prepared. Um, how ready is this city if, in the event, there is some, some type of disaster or emergency? Well, we're fortunate that we have an emergency preparedness committee that uh, has looked at all the issues, is trying to alert the public so that they can participate effectively when something happens. As far as the city being prepared, we have a manual. And this is the manual for this coming year for the mayor as to what our function would be and how we operate during an emergency. And this is basically the Bible for us to follow through. And it's been developed by people who are interested in a process to really do something effective and safe for the community. So we are prepared. Right, and of course it depends on what kind of disaster it is and what happens and you know, where are you gonna be able to go? You know, if it was an earthquake and the road were to go out, you know, you just, in terms of getting around and water and all that, you just, you need to, as a family and, a, and, and people just need to just be ready as best they can, right? I mean, it's well, all about communicating and our emergency preparedness uh, process covers all of those. It covers, you know, water main breaks, uh, earthquakes, uh, fire Terrorism. storms, whatever, uh, because they're all emergencies that go beyond just a little household. And the emergency preparedness committee is published and has sent out what you need to have in your household to be prepared for how long you should consider having to do without a lot of services. Uh, things like that. They tell you things you may not think of where you do have resources that you're not aware of. Right. And they also tell you where you can get resources that you may need that you don't have. So uh, I think they do an outstanding job. Uh, they've been at it for some time. And if you come to our 4th of July parties, they have a booth and they provide information and all sorts of stuff. In fact, uh, at times, our city has actually awarded emergency preparedness kits to people who have uh, done recycling. So the city is actively pursuing keeping the people informed with a good emergency preparedness and plan. A lot of resources right on our own city website. If you go on to rpvca.gov and you can see emergency planning, they tell you, "Am I prepared? You know, what do I need yep. to do?" Um, so it, it is fantastic because yeah. obviously you need to have plenty of water, those kinds of things. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, good. We just want to make sure everybody's ready, set, and ready to go. Well, we keep trying. And we're going to keep going here in the show. Um, we're going to move on to some other issues coming before the council in last month. Um, one of the big issues being talked about right now in our community is um, what's going on with the situation at Ladera Linda and uh, the possibility of soil contamination on the soccer fields. These fields are leased by AYSO from the school district, and uh, but of course it's an RPV. So there's been a lot of moving parts. It's been coming before the council. Just help let the community understand what's going on with this issue and how the city council is trying to help sort through this. Well, as you know, the city has been tracking what's going on and trying to get as much information as it can. However, at this point, all the parties need to step back uh, and let the DTSE, Department of Toxic Substances uh, Commission, uh, do their work. They've started it. They will be the official uh, outfit that will tell us what it is. They will define what action has to be taken. 
So in my view, at this point, it's time to start all the rhetoric, stop all the speculation, let's wait till we get real results instead of coming up with uh, all sorts of rumors. Uh, nobody hates anybody. We don't hate the AYSO, the school district, and they don't hate us. Uh, none of that is really real. What we're trying to do is find out what the answers are for the entire community. And that's where we are now. We are in the process of getting those answers, and hopefully we can, the DTSC can expedite that and get it to us as quickly as possible so we can resolve this issue and then go on and cooperate with all the entities on the peninsula uh, as we should because we all have the community and the kids in mind. Right, and I think that's really where it comes down to the, the, the community just wants answers to know, we know what's in that soil up at Lillet, Darylin, in those fields, and they are capped right now. There's plastic They're over that. They're and capped that's until the DC, DTSC comes up with its answers, and right. we need to be patient and get that and, and stop the rhetoric, stop the speculation. Uh, it doesn't add anything uh, to the issue at all. All it does is gets people angry, it they take sides and that's inappropriate that's not what our community is about really right and now you keep saying dtsc that's the department of state Talk department of toxic substance control yes so hopefully those reports will come quick more quickly and people just are we waiting. hope they would expedite that so we can put this issue to bed know what we have to do get it done and go move forward and get on with with the, with our lives and and the things that we enjoy on a peninsula Okay, well, I appreciate the update, and I know we'll be talking about this going forward. It'll be coming up, I'm sure, until there's the answers are provided and you yep. know what the plan is. Um, and on the subject of Ladera Linda, uh, there was a public workshop up there recently that was put on um, by the staff here to um, look for more community input regarding what's going to happen with Ladera Linda Community Center, plans to actually demolish what's there and eventually build something new for the community. What kind of, I know you weren't, you couldn't attend that, but um, there was a packed crowd and, and people are concerned. They wanna know what are you gonna be putting up there at Ladera Linda? So what do you want the residents to know about that project that's um, well, going forward? I had a prior commitment so I couldn't be there, uh, but I have received a lot of emails and some telephone calls with respect <clears> to that. And uh, the issues and, and the information covers a wide range of subjects. Uh, there is some concern. I don't know uh, whether or not uh, all of it is founded or not. Uh, apparently, the local community feels that this project is much larger than they had anticipated it would be. Uh, the building there would be about the size of what the Hess Park building is, and I don't think that was envisioned by the community. Uh, so. There are things like that that are happening there that uh, raise some questions in the community. One of the big questions is, is this a facility designed for users or is it designed for the community? Because for whatever reason, uh, there were people that were listed as stakeholders who, who really use it, like the YMCA and other organizations. They are not really stakeholders in my mind. They are users. What we need to do is design something to meet the stakeholders, meet the city's requirements. Now, if those facilities then are appropriate for somebody to use like they do rent portions of Hess Park, fine, let's do that, let's make it available. But we don't design it around a customer base, we design it around a resident base. Explain to the community just sort of how, just going back in time, like what is was the council's goal in terms of um, having the improvements at Ladera Linda, why the need and, and like the goal of this whole center? Well, the buildings there are in very poor shape. Uh, a lot of the infrastructure in the buildings, utilities have a problem. Uh, so there, it needs to be redone. There, there's no question about that. It was built a long time ago and uh, as such, it's time for renovation. The question is how? They've had a number of workshops. The local community and those that attended the early workshops were consistent about what they envisioned there. And every time it's come out, it's been a little different than what they expected. And so therefore they're concerned about, gee, are we listening to them? 
Uh, and I think we are, but we need to make sure that not only we are listening to them, but that those involved in doing the planning also understand that less is more, right. as Councilwoman Brooks says. I think the workshop, too, they were saying at that particular one was less is better. <laughs> that was like a, another that, slogan. That's even, that's, that's even a better statement. And, of course, though, you get to balance all the needs of the community for those events. No, yeah. It is a great spot. I mean, yeah. beautiful ocean view. You come up for it's, it's I mean, I live in that neighborhood yeah. near there. But, um, you know, too, they, a lot of people were talking about, you know, when you're, when you're going forward and making improvements at the local parks, is it in the neighborhood of Ladera Lewis Park? No, it's the RPV's park. So you have to look at the big picture. Well, the thing, the thing that I think we have to keep in mind we are open to anyone coming in with suggestions. Mm -hmm. But the primary goal is not from people outside the city telling us what we need to do. Giving us suggestions is fine. We can, they might be appropriate to incorporate for our own people. But the primary goal is our residents who pay the taxes for it, they have the primary and biggest input as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we have, we always get input. I think we are an, an attraction because we get input from a lot of other uh, localities and organizations asking RPV to do some things. At times I question why don't they ask their own jurisdictions for those things, they don't seem to. But that's, that's the reality. We have to emphasize the fact that our taxpayers are paying for it, they get the primary input. Mm -hmm. I think was it Council Member Brooks always is saying we're becoming LA's playground. We have lots of fun places to come to in RPV. Well, you know, since 1973, the social media has changed things. When you have something as good as we have, the social media is going to capture it. And unfortunately, at times, it's overdone and it impacts our residents to the point that they are almost prohibited from enjoying it mm -hmm. for their for themselves. And after all, they pay the taxes to provide it. Um, just to wrap up the Ladera Linda workshop conversation, so what's next for residents waiting to see the process in terms of when something will actually, uh, we're far from a ribbon cutting ceremony there, what, what happens next in the process? Well, the workshop was basically to put together uh, the things that uh, were going to be included and how to design it, where the facilities would be. My understanding is that as a result of this workshop, there's going to be the possibility of another one. Okay. Well, we'll stay tuned for that. You know, we're talking about uh, people coming into the city and wanting to be an RPV, which brings me to the next issues before the council, which was what to do about the short-term rental situation that's been proliferating in the city. And the council made a decision and voted 4-1 to one to absolutely ban short-term rentals, meaning 30 days or less. Um, in residential neighborhoods and that decision came after I think the Planning Commission recommended well let's maybe keep them but with restrictions you decided no nope, let's just there there there's no exception no short-term rentals why did you go that way the issue for me is very is a very simple one we are not a commercial city single-family residential zoning is not commercial zoning and therefore to convert homes into party houses and have corporations buy up homes for the sole purpose of renting them out at a substantial profit uh, in a neighborhood, that's not why we incorporated the city. The, the total function of the city's incorporation, the primary goal was local control. We were controlled by the county 30 miles away. We didn't like that. And, we wanted local control, and that's what it's about. Single family residential zones are not commercial, therefore you don't have a commercial operation. When you have corporations buying three or more homes and using them for that purpose only, if you don't stop it now and you permit it, it's gonna get rampant, and you're gonna destroy the reason we incorporated the city. Secondly, it's a commercial operation. We, we are not in to make TOT out of single family residential zones or permit fees and things like that. That makes it commercial again. And that's not what this city is about. So that's why I voted no. And I think a lot of our colleagues, although they may not have expressed it the same way, felt the same way. 
Right. I mean, you had a lot of testimony from on both sides, the people that are using them. And let's face it, there are people that are renting out rooms probably in a very responsible way and maybe helping bring income. But like, again, in the end, it's, it's a business operation and that, you know, yes. doesn't belong in a residential neighborhood. You're right. So that was a tough one. But the, and the other key thing was, I think, how do you enforce this? I know like Manhattan Beach, there's lots of communities that have banned them, but you go on Airbnb and you see all these places listed. So how will the city enforce this situation? That's a very difficult task. You don't want to have a Gestapo force running around from home to home checking it out. So there are two aspects to it as I see it. Number one, it'll be on a complaint basis. But in order to enforce it, we need an ordinance. Without an ordinance, the sheriff can just come there and say, please quiet down. With an ordinance that says, you're violating the ordinance, you're out of here now. Mm -hmm. So we need that ordinance, and that is being put together as we speak. We should be having that before the council, before too much longer. So we'll have an enforcement basis on a complaint, uh, enforcement based on a complaint basis. Because obviously, if I have a birthday party for my children or my grandchildren, we're going to make noise in the backyard. Uh, and people may complain. But if the sheriff comes and look at it, it's a birthday party or it's a uh, political gathering for people during the political season, uh, whatever. Uh, we're not trying to stop that. We're trying to stop the for-profit commercial party houses, primarily, right. Right. okay? There is another leg to that, in my view at least. For violating this, we have to make the penalty large enough to remove the financial incentive. That, once that gets done, if it gets done and that gets done, then what happens is it's no longer a financial benefit, and that's why it's being run. It's for money. Well, the longer there's no financial benefit, it'll die on the vine and will become Rancho Palos Verdes of 1973 again. Got it. Well, I know I know that uh, the for our hotel in town, Terranea, which leads me into my next area, because I think we've covered that. Um, I remember talking with the um, the president and CEO, Terry Hack, back yes. in the day when these were sort of first popping up. And the one thing with Airbnbs, I mean, they aren't regulated. You really, there's also almost kind of, can be kind of a safety factor. But that hotel down the street, Terranea, there's plenty of places that people can come stay. They're doing incredible. They can stay there, and as, as many people know, uh, there are people who invested in the casitas. And they have a certain period of time that they can actually occupy. The rest of the time, the hotel actually rents them out, and the people who have bought them make some profit, can pay off the loans, and this sort of thing. They're in a commercial zone. To have rentals of that kind of thing in a commercial zone is fine. It is commercial. It's not single family residential. Terranea, by the way, was on the council agenda recently and they yes. came for you because they are doing so well there. They were gonna add a kitchen area off the main pool. And so again, just like recognizing how important that resort is to our community in terms of the TOT, the transient occupancy tax. They're doing really well, good stuff. They're doing very well. Uh, it's something that uh, was, actually planned for and anticipated while we were incorporating the city to have a, a destination hotel there. Uh, and they're doing quite well. Now, I think it was an oversight initially not to have some place where people could get uh, something to eat next to the pool. Because what do you do? Do you go in and change just to get something to eat? Or, you, or do you go dripping wet into the existing well, they, they restaurant? Would bring, they were bringing food to you poolside, but this will but be this, better. But this is better. You can go there and you don't have to wait for it to be brought poolside. Uh, it's an amenity that complements what they're doing. Uh, it's of really no significant impact on the community other than those that are going there, including our residents who can go there. And, and, and so far, any any dollar figure, how much have they brought into the, our coffers in the city for the transient occupancy tax? In, TO, number? in TOT right now, it's in the neighborhood of $5 million a year. Yeah. Now, when you consider that as being a 10% tax on the room rentals only, you can figure out very quickly what they're doing on room rentals only, not counting all the other venues they mm -hmm. have. Got to compliment uh, Taranea, 
Bob Lowe and Terry Hack for what they have done. They have met what the city's concept was of a resort hotel. They've done it in an excellent, very professional manner, as you can tell because of how successful it is, and it's all because of them. Bob Lowe and his organization, when they came to the city, wanted to cooperate with the city to get it done, rather than say, well, you want one, I'll do what I want. It was a very refreshing approach from a developer. It was welcome, and they need to be complimented for it. Oh, it's, it's amazing to have it here, very special. I'm grateful that I live so close to that resort. Um, we only have a minute left. We've jumped around and all covered all kinds of grounds here. Any special mayor's announcements before we wrap it up? You always, I know as mayor, you're not just at council meetings twice a month, you're at committee meetings all over the community doing events. So anything you want to uh, announce? Well, I, the only thing that we've got coming up, we're going to be making some changes in the municipal code to make it uh, a little more descriptive and, and uh, definitive because it's, it's subject to a lot of uh, interpretation now that makes it difficult. We're looking at the protocols. We've learned some things over time. So we're refining those. They will be coming up in, in the not too distant future. One of the things that's uh, a long term away that the council is going to be looking at, we have time because the, the deadline is quite a few years away. But one of the things the council is going to be looking at is how do we deal with the state mandated uh, municipal elections being done on even years in the future. That's going to be something we're going to have to tackle and it's going to be coming up probably, if not by the end of this year, sometime next year, uh, to start dealing with it. Okay. So those are the kinds of things that are coming up. Uh, everything else right now is going quite smoothly. Okay. Well, studying codes and protocols, you're doing a lot of bedside reading. <laughs> Yes, uh, I don't know if the uh, residents have ever noticed on the council tables, uh, we get a tome to read uh, for the election. It's a two and a half inch binder that is chock full of all kinds of paper. It's about yay thick. Maybe it's even three inches, I'm not sure. But that's an awful lot to digest. I would like to make one suggestion to, to the community. We're putting out the agenda earlier. Please try and get your written questions in early enough so they become part of the information we get, say, by Thursday or Friday, so we got the weekend. We get some information at the council meeting. We don't have the time to read it. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be that late, we welcome you to the podium. We want input, we don't want to deny you the chance, but recognize we don't get a chance to read it and the public who's supposed to know what's in there doesn't get a chance to read it. Well, I recommend that if the community comes to as many council meetings, if they can't be watching on our TV on channel 33, the first and third Tuesdays, of course, you can watch it right on your computer too. And it is, I have to say, it's informative, but it's also entertaining. Well, you get this to get to see the inside of how the decisions are made rather than just a decision. And please, fill the council chamber, and if there's an overflow, we've got closed circuit TV in a fireside room, and you can join us there. All right. Love to have you. Well, Mayor Daddy, we love having you here and uh, bring us up to speed, and we'll see you uh, next month. Look forward to it. Thank you. That'll do it for this edition of RPV City Talk. I'm Liz Brown Swanson. Thanks for watching. Have a great day, everybody.